welcome friends to this third and final day and the final session of the three day event of the meditation workshop that we have held in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. I'm very happy to see all of you again. It's always a joy to meet fellow travelers on the same journey that I am doing. You are all fellow travelers with me. You are seeking the same thing that I am seeking. So it's very good to meet each other. As I said in the last couple of days, what we are doing here is merely a method to verify that the statements made by these great mystics and saints, that the truth lies within us and we can find the ultimate truth all within ourselves. That these meditational techniques are a way to verify their truth. They are means, not a goal. They are means to know that we have more than this physical body which makes us alive and gives us the experience of this world. That we have something inside this body which looks like part of the body because it is embedded in this body but it can work independently also. Even when we leave this body, that inner self still is alive. When we are born, that inner self embeds itself into us, provides us along with it a mind and a soul which keeps it alive and also it helps us to see the world, touch the world, hear the world, and use sense perceptions. These sense perceptions are independent of the physical body. Though if we have no knowledge of something existing beside the body, we think they are dependent upon the organs of this body. They are not. Because when we die, they still exist. You can still see with no body. But you don't feel you have no body. You feel still you have a body. But it has no matter. Now, am I just saying something based on hearsay? No. All of you can verify it. You don't have to wait till you die to verify it. You can die while living. Which means you can have the identical experience of death while you are here. So dying while living provides you proof that there is something more than the physical body that constitutes our total self at this time. And that is why these meditational practices help us to verify these two. A large number of people have been able to have some experiences by which they feel there is something else. Some people have had secondary experiences. Like they say a person died, but we feel the person is still in the house. They say this house is haunted and we can see the spirit. Sometimes we can see the spirit and it disappears. Sometimes those spirits open doors and windows. They try to at least open doors and windows, but they can't do it because they don't have matter in their body. But they try to, they energy, try to do those things. A friend of mine, I hope I have his permission because he's in the audience. <laughs> He was looking to buy a house in Chicago area and then suddenly the realtor told him a very nice house is available owned by a lady who just died and the children are far away and they are not interested in the house. They say sell it as it is along with the furniture, along with some unopened equipment like computers. So it was a great deal. And he told me, it's a great deal coming. I said, that's great, buy it. So he bought the house. After he bought the house, he told me, I think that lady is still there. <laughs> because sometimes they see a chair moving in a chair when there is nobody. He the worst thing is when I'm in my bedroom, in my privacy, looks like she opens the door and keeps it. <laughs> that is not good at all. I said, I'm sorry that she's bothering you. I'll come and try to help you. I went and told the lady, of course, the lady woman, I said, please leave this man. He's not used to these things. So the lady left for two months. I, could, I couldn't find any other place, so came back. <laughs> then 
I said, she must be missing the fact that her children never cared for all the things she left behind, not even the house, not even the furniture. So I said, maybe if we take a piece of the furniture away, she might come with the furniture. So my wife and I, we went to his house and picked up a piece of furniture. And I knew the lady was watching. At least I thought so, if she's interested in the furniture. And we brought the furniture to our house. He got no further problems. We started having <laughs> We would hear some strange sounds sometimes. She was trying to express herself. Then ultimately, we said we should take her to a nice place. So we brought her to Wisconsin. We had to bring some furniture too. I am telling you this story just to say that so many of us have had the experience that when you die, everything doesn't disappear. There is something that stays. During my official duties as a district magistrate in one of the districts in India, somebody told me that there is a very remote place where nobody goes because of haunted house. The guest house, which used to be the palace of the old prince, who was murdered there, looked like the prince is still in a, in a spirit form, in a ghost form. And therefore, nobody goes there. I said, I don't mind going there. I always thought that I was very comfortable with these disembodied spirits. From childhood, sometimes when I was a child, I could feel there were other people and I would call them and they would run away. I said, why are you afraid? That was very young. But then I said, I have to go there. So, I went and stayed there. In that old Old house, dilapidated palace, big building, but nobody was there. There was no electric power there. So we had to use some artificial light. And we had to... Uh, I was doing a lot of work in those days, a lot of paperwork. So I was carrying so many of my paper files with me. And I sat inside. I do that in incandescent lamp that I was using. Gas lamp. And I was working at night. There were some sounds here and there coming. I ignored them. I was so busy with my own work. It was very hot. There was no electricity there. There were no fans. So we slept outside. So my attendant, who accompanied me, my secretary wouldn't stay there. He said, I'm not going to stay there. He never ran away. <laughs> but one attendant was there to do my bed. And he put a bed and because there were mosquitoes there, he put a net on it. We used to have a mosquito net in India and it was hot weather. So he put the net and he said, I am going. I said, where are you going? I am going to a village there. <laughs> Nobody stays here. So I was left alone. So I said, doesn't matter. I don't know if any spirit is here or not. If there is any, it will be all right. I am accustomed to seeing spirits, being with spirits. So I finished my work came out and I closed the door. Didn't lock it because it was just a door, there was no lock on it. Closed the door and went and stepped into that net. As soon as I lifted my feet to get into the bed, the door opened. I said maybe there's no wind or something for the door to open. So I got out of the bed. This is a very old story, a very young man talking of that time. And I got out and I but I closed the door again and I came back and as soon as I would put on my feet up, the door would open. I said, this is amazing. <laughs> then I recalled that they told me it's a haunted house. Maybe it is a haunted house. And so I said, doesn't matter, leave the door open. And I tried to sleep soundly. When suddenly above the door there was a kind of ventilator. They have a small ventilator on top of the door there. Near. I saw a huge bird, like a black bird, just flying out of it. I said, oh, now I know what the problem was. It was a bird. So I went to sleep. The morning I got up, there was a very big, thick, thick wall, steel wall there. So I thought there was nothing. And how the bird escaped from there, I still don't know. The those people came back, they said, are you all right? I said, I'm fine, the bird went away. <laughs> now, 
then I told some other officials, now you can go and stay there, there will be no problem. And there was no problem after that. They have also felt that maybe I am an, uh, what is it called, exorcist? <laughs> the driver of spirits. So, in the, when I first came in the 60s to this country, United States, somebody said our house is haunt, haunted. I said, no problem. I come over and drive the haunted people away. So, I made a visit, they never had that again. The point I'm making is that there are examples of such experiences by many people who feel that when we die, something remains. It's not visible to us. But can we see them while we are still in the body? If they can see us, they can try to contact us. And they do try to contact us. All these things that we are hear, hearing about their activities, is they are trying to contact us. They are missing us. Maybe we are missing them too, and that's why they are missing us. That is why people come and tell me, my mother died, and I am missing her. I said, please don't. Don't hold up her progress. We probably want to go to a place, in a better place. We are holding her back. Because if you are missing her, she will miss you. You wish her good journey, wish her the best. Say whatever is happening, I wish you and pray for the best for you. I say that to all the people who ask me about people or their senior or elder who passed away. Let's help them to make further progress instead of trying to pull them back. Some people cry so much, we want you back, we are missing you. And then with that attachment, try to bring them back. Now the question is, is it possible to verify that there is life after death. I'll tell you another interesting story. Maybe I, I might should be a storyteller. Right? <laughs> True story. This is right in the beginning, in the 60s, when I came to the United States. I had to give a talk in Detroit, Michigan. And I came on a fellowship. I came to study at Harvard University. I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I knew many people who had their satsang centers or they had centers where they had meetings. So some of them invited me, but the Detroit one, they had a Ford Motor Company headquarters there, and the Ford Company was responsible for funding part of the fellowship on which I came to Harvard. So they had arranged for me to visit their factory in Detroit. The General Motors, which also had a factory, they had a General Motors technical center. And the government had made a plan that if I come from India and I take the technology from there to India, I should also visit their General Motors technical center, which was not open to the public, so I, it was special permission granted by them. So I had an appointment in two places in Detroit. So I tried to make a visit to Detroit at the same time when they were having a meeting on a weekend or something. I said, these Satsangis are having a meeting, I'd like to join them. So they, I called the head of the Satsang at that time and I said, I have come from India and I have some appointments to make in Ford Motor Company and so I, I tried to make it the same weekend that you are having a program. So I can attend. He said, he talked to his wife, said these Indians, they come and come and try to, you know, exploit us or something, and he's trying to come and so he can stay here or have our food or something. He went very mad. He said to me, sorry, we are very busy at this time. We cannot meet anybody. We can't host anybody. So sorry, uh, we can't invite you. I said, that's all right, but I've already fixed the time on the same date that I found. I have fixed my appointment to go to the Ford Motor Company. They have arranged a guest house for me in the factory. They have also arranged one of the secretaries to receive me at the airport and take me in, a, in their company car and I have been taken care of, so you don't worry. I went on the appointed day over there and then I was Getting out of the plane, I was coming out and a man, elderly man, stands in front of me 
He says, Are you Ishwapuri? He said, Yes, sir. Are you from Ford Motor Company? He says, No. I am the guy, the president of the Salsa here. I have come to take you home. I said, Sorry, I have already made a arrangement. You told me that you have no time and you are busy and can't see me. So I made arrangements. The secretary is waiting for me. He said, No, it's cancelled. I have cancelled that uh, your appointment and to stay in the guest house. You're staying with us. I said, but you have to tell them. He said, told them. The vice president of Ford Company, who is in charge of this factory, he is my son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> he said, okay, then you must be right. So he took me in his car. He said, do you know that I have never seen you? I only know your name. I didn't know if you wear a beard, you wear a beard, you wear a turban, or what you look like, and who you are, how old you are, young you are. No idea at all. And yet I found you. I said, how did you do that? He said, very simple. I talked to my master. I closed my eyes. I said, master, I don't know this fellow. You tell me. When I opened my eyes, you are the next person in front of me. <laughs> I said, you Americans are wonderful. <laughs> I have never been able to do such a thing. I have to learn this technique from you. Anyway, we went, went to their house and the committee of sorts of women, some elderly women, some men sitting and uh, making ready for a dinner for me. They sat there. I had just come from India, very little knowledge about American customs or how they would treat their guests. We are used to something different in India. So they sat at the table and they said, we are very glad that uh, Ishwapuri is here from India, his great master disciple, and he will say grace. <laughs> I have never said grace. <laughs> I was comfortable what to say now. <laughs> So, just at that moment, a little wisdom came to me. Say something in your own language. <laughs> you won't understand it. <laughs> so, I said loudly, very loudly, I said in Punjabi language. Chako ji khana. <laughs> That we we'll eat it up now. <laughs> <laughs> they all look so surprised. What has he said? <laughs> then the host got up. He said, he has said some nice uh, grace in Punjabi. I will translate it to English. <laughs> then he gave a long speech. <laughs> Oh Lord, we are very happy for the food to give us. We are grateful to you. We are very happy we have a special guest come to us from India. We thank you for him. We thank you for the food. Very interesting. So I felt very alarmed because I was already started eating. So I had to put the bottle of food back. Anyway. After that, I didn't know what to do now. So I began to say, they, they are saying, thank you, thank you. Maybe, maybe we should have thanked, thanked for the food. They said, what are you muttering in your mouth? I said, I'm saying, why do we say thank you? How can we thank the Lord? Are we equal to the Lord? Are we getting the creative power that runs this universe? Is somebody just a person or somebody sitting somewhere? They said, hold on, bring the recording, recorder with me. <laughs> and first time my talks began to be recorded. And very interesting. Then they said that we have arranged your talk. I said, why did you arrange my talk? Don't you have your own regular meetings? They said, the regular guy comes, his name is Mr. Replogal, he comes from Chicago and he's sick. Then we have an alternate, a backup. Who lives here, he is gone to India. Then third one of us comes and that also person is not here. So we couldn't find anybody to speak. So this committee, which is now having dinner, decided 
okay, this fellow is coming from India, let's get him. He will tell some stories about India. So that is why we are asking you to now speak. So it was a veteran memorial hall in Detroit. They had a meeting. They took me there. And there I, I, I got up and spoke. When I spoke, before I spoke, I just closed my eyes for a minute. Because it was a large unknown audience. But anyway, I did speak something. And there, this host was sitting in front of me. When I finished, he got up to thank me and he said, I know what you did. You closed your eyes and you asked your master, great master, what to say. And he must have told you what to say. The lip like great master's talk. I said, I tried. I said, let me try the American way. That you could find me by closing your eyes and asking. I said, I also close my eyes and ask master, what should I tell these people? And when I closed my eyes, my master said, who are you to be my spokesman? <laughs> he almost got a slap from him. <laughs> he didn't work for me. <laughs> he said, if I have to speak, I can speak. You quietly sit down. So I quietly sat down. And what you heard was in my body, a great master's voice. So that is why you felt like this. But it is not something. Now, while this was going on, there was a man at the back, standing, a Jewish man, Canadian, but then he became a U.S. citizen later. He was standing at the back. I could see him at the end of the hall, just standing and smiling all the time. I had no idea who he was. After I went back, I had to catch a flight. I went back to Boston, and at midnight, 12 o'clock, phone rings. My host wife calls. She says, there is a man here who is facing life and death problem. And he says, he has to see you right now. And I told her, told him, he's been calling me, I told him that look, the speaker of today has gone back. He was not, he doesn't live here. He came from Boston and gone back already. It's late. He said, I have to see him right now or I'll kill myself. So, I had never heard this kind of emergency, so I said, how am I going to handle it? I said, is that man somewhere near you? He said, yeah, he's sitting here, in our house. He has come all the way to our house. So I picked up the phone, I said, what is his name? His name is Lionel Fishman. I said, okay, Mr. Lionel, what's your problem? He said, I have to see you right now. I said, sorry, I won't see you right now. I'll see you in April. I'm coming to Chicago to for a Bandara, 2nd of April, Red Box of Bandara. If you can make it there, come. If you can't wait, kill yourself. <laughs> I said these words. I don't know how I said them. <laughs> He said, I will wait. <laughs> Amazing story. Now, what has actually happened? This boy was a Jewish Canadian boy and he came to New York and he found they were recruiting people from the Air Force, US Air Force. This is old story before the Second World War. He got recruited for the Second World War and he went and he was in Japan fighting. At the end of the war in 1945, he got married to a Japanese girl, Tai. And he loved her very much. They loved each other and they began to have a good time. They said, we settled back in the United States. They came, first stayed in California and then settled in Denver. One day, this boy and his wife, they were driving their car. And the man said, look how blessed we are. How blessed we are. We got a beautiful house. I've got a beautiful wife who takes such good care of me that they won't go. She said, I am so happy with you. When they were saying these words, they went into a red light, a truck came, crashed into the car, Ty was killed right there. 
the way it was given. This man couldn't believe. How can God, the Creator, when we are thanking Him, when we are praising Him for the blessings He has given us, kill my wife at that time? It didn't make any sense. So therefore, he got into great depression. He had a friend named Morton, and he called Morton, I can't survive, I have to kill myself to go and see where I have gone. I can't believe this thing can happen. He went to the synagogue, met the rabbis, he went to churches, he went to other holy people to find out, do you have any idea where a person goes when he dies? They said, they go to heaven or hell, something like this, they made stories, they didn't appeal to him at all. And so he said, I have to kill myself in order to go and find my wife died. Therefore he decided that took the antidepressants he was taking every few hours, mortal stayed by his side so he doesn't commit suicide. And he said, I am going to kill myself. He had an office in Detroit where he worked on the sixth floor of the building. He said, I'll go on a Sunday, office is closed, I have the key, I'll jump out of the window and kill myself. So on that particular Sunday, he went up to his office and he opened the door, locked it up, he locked up his office and a typewriter. On the typewriter, he began to write the reasons for his taking a step to kill himself. Last minute note. He typed out that he has been to all these people, he's been to rabbis, he's been to church priests and all the holy people. Nobody would answer where I have gone. So I'm going to find out myself by killing myself. I hope God will forgive me. So when he typed that, he moved to the window, opened the window, and saw down and said, this is very easy to jump six floors, no problem, I will kill myself. When he was about to jump, his hand was on a table next to the window, and his hand slipped because there was a newspaper lying there. And he slipped hand, he looked to the newspaper, and local newspaper, and the heading was, a man from India here to tell that there is life after death. <laughs> heading. It was, it was a news about my talk in Detroit. A newspaper had covered that. He said, how can this happen? Just when I'm about to die, something happens and brings a newspaper here. He said, let me first find out what this is. So he read that tomorrow there will be a talk by me. And it will be held in that place, Veteran Memorial Hall. He said, I have to wait till tomorrow. Or maybe till next Sunday. So, he waited. Now, this is all before the telephone call, he said, telling. So, he decided that he is to wait till tomorrow. Suddenly, he realized newspaper is on Saturday. And the talk was the same day, 3 o'clock. So, when he found that, he rushed because he could hardly make it in time. Meeting had already started. I was already speaking when he arrived. He was in Boston, standing at the back, which I saw. He tried to come forward, and there was a long line. After when I finished talking, long line, just shaking hands and saying thank you for coming. So he stood in line. Then he came close to and look at me closely. And he came, but the line was long. So he went, and there were some books being sold. And he bought one of the books and he began to stand in line. When the line was halfway through, uh, the, my host said, sorry, no more handshaking. He had to take a flight and carried me by my arm. He went out to the car and I did it. And that is when he went home and he said, how could you, talking to me, and said, how could you do this to me? You sent me a message and I know that you sent me a message so I don't commit suicide, I have to talk to you. And therefore, I don't know where you are. He went back. The janitor said, we just cleaned up the place. We don't know who came, where they came. They just rented a hall. They rent the hall every month. We don't know who the people are. He couldn't find. He went home. He said, okay, Mr. Ishwar Puri, now it's a challenge to you. If you sent me the newspaper and called me and I have seen you and you ran away before talking to me. Now you wait and see till next Sunday when I kill myself if you don't come. 
to talk it to him. And as he talked, it knocked like this. The lamp was knocked. It was next to him. And the book was there. And the book fell down. When he picked up the book, to one of those publications by Vishak Sahitan, and the pay, last page opened. It gave the address of people where you can contact. And he saw one address in Detroit of my host and his wife. And he picked the book, saw the telephone number, and called them. It was midnight. And that is when they called me. So what a coincidence. And he was amazed at the coincidence. But he said, I have to meet him as soon as I can. I'll try right now, he told them. But when I talk to him, okay, wait till April. Otherwise, go kill yourself. What is the big deal? I don't think killing and dying is a very big thing. Anyway, he waited. When he waited, after a couple of months, this was the end of April. In April 2nd, I was in Chicago. And my daughter of the master, I was giving a talk there. He said, I'm not interested in the talk. I want personal interview with him. Because I prepared a list of questions. I prepared my questions. What is life? What is death? What happens after death? What proof is there? So many questions he had written down. And he said, I have to ask him those questions. So he waited outside. Didn't come to the talk. So Badara took second April. And he was waiting that he has to drive me. He told me, can I drive you to Detroit? I said, I have a meeting in Detroit with an organization called Spiritual Frontier Fellowship, SFF. And their board is waiting to see me. And the chairman is a woman, the chairwoman, and there are five, six people on the board. They want to meet me. So they are waiting in Detroit. I don't mind you driving me. I was going to be driven by two other ladies from Chicago. He said, I want to drive you because I can then talk to you on the, on the way. And my wife was there, she said, please don't go to that car. <laughs> this man is suicidal. <laughs> I said, no, don't worry. Don't worry. He, he's postponed his suicide. <laughs> that should make you feel happy. Anyway, they were very worried. And the ladies were to drive me. And my wife in that car, another car. This guy alone is driving me. And he said, here are my questions. At that time, this is a new drive for me. I never had a drive from Chicago to Detroit, jeep over a long bridge, skyway or something. So I said, can't we wait till we get out of town? Please drive carefully. He said, no, we can't wait because I have too many questions to ask you. And we won't have time. I said, how long does it take to go to Detroit? Oh, four or five hours it'll take. I said, surely there's a lot of time. No, 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 you don't know my very fundamental questions to ask you. I said, please wait a few minutes. Till, till I can calm myself down. <laughs> anyway, we drove out and then I began to talk to him. I said, look, this is a very simple matter. Life doesn't end when we die. Only body ends. Life continues. Then I began to explain how it is. And I said, one can even see those people who have died if we also get into the same state in which they are, which is to be a disembodied person. That can be achieved by meditation. By meditation, when we become unaware of our physical body, we become aware of our inner body, and that is when we can be like them, and we can see them. Then they can see us also. But they can see us even in physical bodies, because the eyes are still there, the same eyes they were seeing when they were in physical bodies. The sense perception remain intact. So I gave a talk and told him all this and went on and on for about 10-15 minutes. Maybe 15-20 minutes. And then I waited that he'll start his long list of questions. And he was smiling. And we kept on driving. He was quiet. I said, maybe what's happened to him? I hope he's not getting suicidal again. <laughs> <laughs> then we drove for about an hour and he said, you want a rest talk? A number one stop. I said, yes, I would like a number one, two. I don't know what you <laughs> Whatever they are, number one, we have to stop. So we stopped at a rest place. And when we got out, my wife ran from the back. He said, are you all right? <laughs> I said, perfectly all right. 
Then we resumed our journey. Then he spoke first time. He says, do you know, I have memorized all my 110 questions. Because I knew I won't be able to read it right away. I memorized all of them. And I am going over each one of them as you spoke. You answered most of them. And the remaining were irrelevant. They didn't mean anything. I have no question to ask. I was very impressed with myself. <laughs> I must have done something great. <laughs> I don't know what the questions were. <laughs> so that is why we reached there. And then we reached there, the board the of directors of SFF, Spiritual Frontier Fellowship, they were waiting in the house of our host, same host who invited me earlier in Detroit. And this boy says, would you mind if before you start the meeting with them, you could go to my house. I set it up and the last time when we went out and she got killed, she had set up a place for a tea party that we were going to have with a couple of friends. We never had that party. If Ishwar, you and your wife can come and just bless our house and have that tea, it's time prepared, we'll be very grateful. I asked my wife, asked her board, are you, this is a man having a suicidal thoughts and it's a life of death question. And he's requesting me to go to his house and come back. I'll take a few minutes and come back. Will it be all right? He says, it's all right. Go, please. Yes, yes, please. We'll wait for you. I didn't know the house was far away. He drove hour and a half <laughs> to his house. And then the tea took place. It was very beautifully done. She was a very aesthetic person, I can tell you, that lady. Because she decorated the house in Japanese style so beautifully. And we had her tea which she had prepared. And he warmed up the tea and we both had. And he chatted a little and drove back. I said, those people must have gone back. We'll reach at midnight now. <laughs> so we reached our host's house where we were supposed to stay. And we saw the board still sitting there. And I expressed great Apologies to them. I said, I'm very sorry. I had no idea. The distances are so many here. And I couldn't come in time. So, I know you are waiting for me to talk to me. The president was a lady sitting in the center of it. Four or five people around her. So, I began to say, I understand that you have yourself this movement, fellowship. And what does self mean? What does fellowship mean? Just talked about 10 15 minutes about what the title of the, of the organization meant. And then I said, If you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer this. This boy was standing behind me when I was talking. So the president said, She had a paper in her hand. She said, I have no question. You have answered my questions. Then she asked the other members of the SFF, Do you have any questions? No. This boy laughed at the back. That's what I was waiting to hear. <laughs> That's happened with me. This is, of course, he did. He got initiated. He got initiated. such good progress. And he was able to see his wife. I am telling this old story, a very interesting story, how this happened, how the coincidences occurred. But the point was that if we feel that this body is our only self, we are totally mistaken. And we can verify it right now. By simple process of meditation. And the process is simple. Which we have been talking about the last two days. To recap it. Number one. Very important point. Do not attempt any meditation. Till you have found the right place to meditate. Which is behind the eyes. In the third eye center. Any other place you sit will draw your attention to that place. We want to draw attention, pull the attention back, withdraw the attention back to our own self, which is operating as we are waking and alive the third eye center behind the eyes. First, practice locating yourself there. Doesn't matter if it takes time. Practice locating yourself behind the eyes. Just see what happens if you feel you are in the head. What other experiences are happening? Let the mind think what it like, you watch, watch it. Let other pictures come, you observe them. Let old memories come and go in front of you like a TV screen, just watch them. 
but stay in the center. Practice to stay in the center of the head when you are comfortable. And you can go anytime and feel comfortable if the rest of the body is below you, around you, if the ears are inside of you, eyes are in front of you, you are in the right place, then only stop meditation. Very important point. I missed several years after initiation and not understanding the simple point. And now I find that some people who didn't miss several years, they missed 40, 50 years without getting any benefit in meditation. A very important point. Second point, mind thinks, therefore distracts us. Mind is the only obstacle that is coming in the way of your discovering yourself. No other obstacle. There is no enemy outside of us on our spiritual journey except our own mind. Therefore, deal with the mind by repeating your Simran, mantra, repeating the words that have been given to you by your own perfect living master, if you have been lucky enough to have those words. Because those words, when you repeat, are not only simple words to substitute the words of thought, they also carry an empowered quality, very empowered quality. They do not allow negativity to come while you are repeating them, even the negativity of your own mind. Very useful. If you have been initiated by a perfect living master and he's given you some word to repeat, they are not ordinary words anymore. They become empowered when you are initiated. And those words prevent negativity to come. Even you can use them for outside negativity. It will go away. So that is why use those words and repeat them with the mind, not with the tongue. In the beginning, you start with the tongue. You can't help it. Later, the tongue will move along with your repetition. When you think, tongue doesn't move. How come when you want to repeat those words with the mind, the tongue moves alongside? Because the mind doesn't want to pick them up. The mind resists. Mind will fight. Mind is the only thing that fights you during this spiritual exercise. So therefore, practice repeating those words with the mind. Next point. When you repeat, repetition is not enough. Listen attentively. To those words. Listening attentively draws you to yourself because the soul, your real self, a listener, not the speaker. To speak, it has been given an agency that much. So that is why when you repeat with the mind, listen attentively. The more attentively you listen, the more you are withdrawing your attention. And at some point, if you are doing it regularly, you will be able to hear sounds inside. Several sounds. Some sounds are very coarse, like the thunder, sound of thunder, like sound of a truck going outside, like sound of some bricks falling, something like a, like a shower going on, like waterfall. All these sounds are being generated from either the physical self or the astral self, sensory self, and they do not come from the self. Most of these sounds are not in the center, but they come from the sides. Many sounds come from the left side, many sounds come from the right side, some come from the center, and some are undefined. They look like surround sounds, they come from all over. When you hear these sounds, if you only hear some sound from one side, whether left or right, start listening to it or practice. Practicing also helps you to withdraw your attention to your own self inside. And once you are able to withdraw attention to some extent, the real sounds will start coming from the self. We are so far distracted by outside sounds, outside, outside experiences, that it takes a while to get that real sound from the center. The real sound center will be like it's coming from where you are at the third eye center or looking above it. Because the space here, when you imagine you are there, the space creates yourself and in a space like this, not like this. So that is why the side sounds are only very temporary and they practice. If you hear sounds from both right side and left side, prefer the right side. So that the intuitive side, the intellect is the reasoning side. It just helps everything. I had a friend of mine who told me he has been listening for 15 years. The sound from the right side, he was told the right side contains the real sound and the left side contains the negative sound. I don't know how this message has fallen around. 
the ears have to hear. When they hear sound comes, you don't even know where the ears are. You are trying to withdraw your attention from the body. How can you confine yourself to one side of the physical body and think that you will escape from it or get out of it? Therefore, both right and left are not the real sound. The real sound comes from the center. It's coming from your own self. And the sound is not coming from the physical self at all. It's coming from the internal self, the third eye center of the inner body, which is also there. It's coming from the formless body of the mind, which is also there. It's coming from the soul, which is also there. It's coming from your true home, which is also there. It's therefore, the deeper you go to that place, that is everything will open up from there. You don't go to right or left sound, go to the center. Practice for a while. It is not, this is not very simple thing. We have just done exercises here. This was a very little time. Practice for a while in these stages. When the sound comes and is strong enough, sound that resembles the bell, large big bell sound. Little bells will come earlier. When the little bells come, you are ready for getting the bell, big bell. Chirping of crickets comes a little earlier than the little bell. Then the little bell goes. Sometimes they mix up and several sounds can be heard at the same time. But play with them. That means listen to one, listen to the other, see which one is close, which one is far. This bell sound looks in the beginning, it's at a distance, coming from a distance. Others are all very close. So when you pick up that, it's oh, it has a little melody. More melodious, more attractive sound. When that comes up, pick up that sound and try to listen to that. When you listen to it, it comes closer and closer to you. It looks like it's coming closer. Actually, your attention is pulling it. Your attention is going closer to it, but it looks like the sound is coming closer to you. When you can hear the sound regularly, listen, that's your meditation. You can talk even the words unless you are feeling the mind is bringing something negative. Repeat the word to take care of negativity and keep it on the sound. Sound alone is enough for meditation. Then, after you practice this mechanical side of meditation, then you begin the real thing, the dhyan path, the contemplation of the master to bring love and devotion in your meditation. You will not be able to cross the mind if you do not bring love and devotion into the meditation. Love and devotion is the secret of meditation. If you have love and devotion with true faith, with no doubts in your mind, nothing else is required except love and devotion with 100% faith. All these things will create faith slowly in you. When the faith is complete, nothing else is needed except your constantly remembering the master with love and that can take you to your true home. Every time you have this experience of love, meditation becomes better and you can check it out. So that is why love and devotion should be introduced as soon as you can when you have stabilized your center, third eye center, are able to repeat the words, are able to hear the sound and then express your love and devotion and visualize, not from your imagination, visualize your beloved master from the way you actually saw him. The actually meeting him by memory. Because that was a real person that you are remembering. If you make it up, that's your mind making it up. But if you remember something, that's what you actually were living. A living person you you met and therefore you were able to recall or remember. Which also makes it clear for many people, am I initiated if I've never seen my master? I have to say, sorry, you are not. You have to wait for next year, next life. Because this is, it is essential to be able to have the contemplation of the master for having a real, that stage of love and devotion which alone takes you about. You can go part of the way without that. You can go even up to the causal plane with great effort, but not beyond that. To go to our true home, we need the actual experience of a perfect living master being remembered by us with love and devotion. So make that part of your meditation. So these are some of the steps that you can take. If you do your repetition of words as a habit, while walking, while doing other things, while cooking, while doing other chores, it becomes a habit, then you don't have to try to do this, it happens automatically. 
if you start hearing sounds regularly, you'll be hearing them all the time, whether you're meditating or not. So two of the parts that I'm mentioning are automatic. If you love your master, you'll be remembering him all the time, that's also automatic. So meditation is an automatic way of living. You just have to do battle the mind which is taking you away from this. When the, when the experiences are good, even the mind starts loving it. Then even mind doesn't become an obstacle, but becomes a friend of yours and wants to have more of that experience. That's the best stage that will come in your life automatically if you just follow these steps of meditation. Later on, you will see that you are seeing master in everything that is happening. Now remember, <clears throat> spiritual progress cannot be measured only by what you see inside. Sometimes you don't see anything inside. You are busy with your work, but you see master's hand is everything outside. Miracles are happening outside, nothing is seen inside. You say, I'm not making progress. I'm telling two stories. I thought I had finished telling stories, but no. <laughs> uh, a couple of stories about what we can see. Let me tell you the story of my master's master, Sahabat, Sahabat Singh, was my master. He was initiated by another master named Baba Jamal Singh. And Baba Jamal Singh was a soldier and he's very retired. He was very keen to have more experiences. He was initiated by a Swamiji from Agra, Sir Sridhar Singh, who was uh, popularly known as Swamiji, starting the Radha for me, line of masters. He was his initiate. One day he wrote a letter to his master, Beloved master, I am missing you. Please give me time when I can come and see you. In those days, mail took a long time. So, he wrote that letter to his master, Swamiji, and waited for a reply. It took a month or so for a reply to come. And Swamiji wrote to him, My beloved son, Jamal Singh, I am very happy to get your letter and to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions. And Jamal Singh said, My soul goes nowhere. I am having no experience at all. And what is this one he writing? So he wrote another letter. He said, Beloved Master, my soul goes nowhere. I am only missing you. I just want to see you. I am missing you so much. I can't wait to see you. Please give me time to come and see you. This letter which you wrote must be for somebody else. And he got another reply. He said, Beloved son, Chairman Singh, I am very happy to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions. And so far as coming to see me is concerned, you can come in the first week of next month. He said, how can Swamiji write these two letters? My soul is going nowhere. And how did he write this? So he takes those two letters to him and goes on the first week of next month to see his master Swamiji in Agra. And he goes there and places the two letters at his feet and he says, Master, you sent these two letters. They were not meant for me. My soul did not go anywhere. So Swamiji said, oh really, let's go in and meditate a little. The 10, 15 people were sitting outside. He was sitting outside. It was good weather. So he took Jamal Singh inside his chamber for maybe half an hour or so. And they both came out. And then Swamiji said, now tell me Jamal Singh, when I wrote that letter that your soul was roaming in higher regions, was it roaming in higher regions? Yes, Master. I am not asking whether your soul was roaming around in the half an hour we meditated. I am asking, did your soul roam around in higher regions when I wrote the letter to you? He said, yes, Master, my soul was roaming around at that time when we wrote letters. Other people were surprised what they are talking about. So then Swamiji explained to the other people. He said, we have come with a bundle of tasks and obligations called karma. We have our lives in which your obligations and we do a lot of things in this physical world to fulfill our karma. We all have to do it. Some have a heavier load, some have a slightly lighter load. We all have a load and obligations require that we have to work outside in this physical world. Masters know that. Therefore, 
while you're busy there, if your attention is pulled into higher experiences all the time, you may not be able to fulfill all the obligations required outside and therefore may have to come back again just for the sake of fulfilling some obligations. Masters don't want that. They want you to clear your accounts here before you go to a true home. Therefore, they put a blinder on you sometimes. While you're having an experience inside, that's what makes you feel you're missing your master. That's what makes you feel you miss your master so much. So therefore, when you miss your master so much, it's not merely an indication that you're missing because you love him. It means you're making progress inside. When later on you are able to do meditation and go inside, you will remember that that is when you are able to actually see your thing. Your own memory comes up at that level. And you remember when you are missing master, that's when your soul is actually ascending inside. But the blinders were not letting you see it. So then the blinders are removed. You can remember yourself where you were. So this is an example which he gave that we do not always have an internal spectacle to judge if we are having a higher progress in our meditation. Sometimes external experiences tell us, our feelings tell us what is happening. More and more coincidences take place when we make progress on meditation. So there are several ways in which you can judge that progress. So do not worry if you have come to believe only inner visions can tell us that we are making progress. That is not true. If you are if your job requires more work outside, then inner visions can come later on, the right time. But you pay off your karma and you pay off your accounts that we have to pay to negative entities who run this universe. We are not in our true home. We owe something here. Let's finish our accounts and then we can go back. Second story is of another gentleman. He is the daughter married to my uncle. So part of me, I knew from a family relationship also. His name was Devan Dariyaila. He written some books, very nice books. And he was working in one of the small states, Kapoorthala state, which is very, about 20 miles away, very close to the Dera, where Gate Master gave his discourses. So Dariyaila was a finance minister of his state. He was a judicial officer, he was a judge for a while. He was also in some other high position in the state, highly educated person. And he was following the master, was initiated by him. When he retired from his job, he came to great master. He said, Master, I have retired. I want to be around you here now. So give me some seva, some service to do in the data. Great master said, Devan Sar, Dariyaidar, you are such a highly educated person, have so much experience, you can take any job you like. You can become the secretary of this organization, you can take care of all the administration that is run here, whatever job you want, you can take. And Dariyaidar said, no sir, I only want to be your doorman. If I can stand outside your door, and I want that job. Great master smiled, he said, all right. And the rest of his life, he spent standing outside the door of Great Master's house. He was very happy. He saw people, tears in their eyes, with so much love and devotion coming to see Great Master. He couldn't believe there can be such so much devotion existing in this physical world. And it was very inspiring for him. And he did the seva. With great humility, one of the most humble people I have seen. Wonderful person. After a few years, he tells the great master, Master, I have enjoyed my job that you gave me. The same was so wonderful. But I suddenly realized I missed out on my meditation. Instead of meditating, I was just standing outside your door. I understand, Master, this summer you are not going to your usual hill station where you go every year, which is in a town called Dalhousie. And you are not going to Dalhousie this year. Can you please give the keys of your house to me? I'll go for three months and I'll meditate every day and catch up with what I missed out. <laughs> Great Master said, certainly, here are the keys, go. So he took the keys of Great Master's house and went up to that beautiful resort, Dalhousie, and he said, I'm going to meditate for three months, day and night, and catch up with all the lost, lost time. They could not meditate earlier. 
And then as soon as you open the door of the house, a man comes running. And the plumber, I was waiting for somebody to come. I would do some work here. So he started his work, making some noise. More people came and disturbed him. He could not meditate at all. He tried very hard every day. There was so much distraction. He said, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. After three months, totally disappointed, he went back to the great master. And said, master, here are the keys of the house. I failed. I failed in what I was supposed to do. I could not do proper meditation. Great master laughed. He said, you did not fail. You passed. He said, how did I pass? He says, you found out it's not in your hands even to do meditation. He was, that is grace of a master. He said, this is our own mind, our ego that says, I can do more meditation. I can do this or that. We're all ego. There's no place for ego on this path. And therefore, we have to submit to his grace and his blessings that give far more than any effort that we can ever make. So he passed. Now, here again is an example where we start thinking it's the meditations that will give us everything. If we are constantly aware of our meditation, I am going to meditate, I am going to meditate more, I am going to give eight hours of meditation today. Imagine how strong the I is growing, the ego is growing, how strong we are making our own mind. We are not submitting to the love of the Master who alone can do everything. And when we do one step, small step, he can do 10 steps, sometimes 100 steps for us. And we don't realize that. It's a, the a ego is the face of the mind and comes in our way. That is why there's nothing like a blessing from a master. There's nothing that he can bless and makes us greater progress. Love and devotion is a sign of progress. Missing a master, sign of progress. Meditation is merely a method. Great master used to say, meditation is like a thermometer. The thermometer doesn't give you fever. It only measures it. And progress is like a fever. Therefore, you can't use a thermometer to see you've got fever. You can know how far you're gone. With meditation, you can measure where you are going. But you can't say meditation takes you there. So that is why there's a limitation to the efforts a mind can make even in meditation. So it's a good story to remember that the subject matter of spirituality is very limited to Love and devotion. Love and devotion. Blessings of the perfect living master who comes in a human form. Who is he? As a human being. Looks like ordinary human being. Maybe little enlightened or something. That's all we can think. He is the, he is the creator himself. In a human body. It takes time. We verify this by meditation. When we discover we are all creators. Of the entire creation. But we are not. But we are sitting in part of the creation. As thinking that we have to see. From one point of view. Even a soul. Is not separated from the total. It's always together. I try to give a very crude. Simple example. A glass of water. I said glass of water. One glass of water. There are two. Not three, four, only one. I can see one. If you see two, that means you had too many drinks. <laughs> you know that. A father was telling his son, son, don't drink too much. Because if you drink too much, these two glasses will look like three. He said, dad, I can see only one. <laughs> this glass of water, <laughs> this glass of water contains drops of water. I can see very small drops of water hugging each other and all loving each other and beautifully sitting in this glass of water. I can also see just one glass of water. I can see one and I can see many. What is making one into the many? Nothing here. My awareness. My awareness is making the one. My awareness is making the many. I can reduce the size. Very small drops. I can make bigger drops. Awareness is creating. I shrink my awareness to one little point as it's a drop of water. All are together. Our souls are like that in our two homes. The souls are all one, but they're made 
into separate for the experience of love. That is the whole thing when they are all together, they are loving each other, they are all together, the beautiful experience. The one and the many are the same. And then we are talking of a state where there is no glass and there is no space and time. It's all happening in the one. So that is why, please do not think that the meditational techniques by themselves will lead you to your true home if there is no blessing and there is no help from a perpetual master. And moreover, as I said in the beginning, I gave you the truth. The truth is, when a perfect living master accepts you, says, I initiate you, I accept you, I will take you back to your true home, your job is over. Great master, or perfect the master's work starts. So, but we, our mind doesn't accept that. Therefore, though, he says, okay, verify. Verify, this is the truth. The more you verify, the more the truth comes up. And ultimately, you get to the same state as the master. And you find the master was right from day one. Not to that, not when you realize it. I'm very happy to share all these experiences with you for these three days. Our program ends here now.